Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Melissa Abache. I will be hosting today's webinar. We're gonna wait a couple of minutes for everyone who has registered for today to join through Zoom. It takes a couple of minutes and we know there's a lot of you who have registered for today. We're expecting a big group and you're joining from lots of different countries and time zones. So we'll wait, wait a couple of minutes. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just as a reminder, this webinar is called Why Study Molecular Biology and Genetics, and it's being hosted here at Koch University. Um, I work at the International Student Recruitment Directorate, and I will explain what we're going to do today. Whilst we wait for everyone to join, um, we have a short video uh, to pass the time and also to show you in case you're not familiar with, with Turkey or the university a little bit about our university. So I'm gonna start playing that. It lasts for uh, two minutes approximately. Okay, so thank you for watching our video. I hope it gave you a short glimpse of uh, who we are as a university. So what we're gonna do today is that we're gonna give a very quick overview, especially for those who are not familiar at all with our institution. Then we're gonna talk in a bit more detail about our College of Science, because this is where our bachelor's in molecular biology and genetics is hosted in. And then we'll go into a bit more detail about the program. However, the most exciting part about today really is the fact that we have with us five of our undergraduate molecular biology and genetics students um, who are also international students from different countries. They're also from all different years in terms of um, their studies. And we're also very lucky that we have one of our professors from the department with us. And they are going to be answering your questions. And I also prepared some questions that I have been meaning to ask them. So in terms of how we're gonna work, um, I will be doing that first part, which is a presentation. In the meantime, if there are any questions that start to pop in your head that you would want to ask our students, you can type those questions on the Q&A 
uh, part of the panel control that you see on your screens. If you're if you're joining us from your mobile or from your laptop computer, you can find it at the top or at the bottom of your screen. In a mobile phone, I know it's a bit trickier, but you should be able to find it. If not, then you can also type your questions on the chat part of the of the screen. Um, we will not be using the raise hand and unmuting participants uh, today, so I kindly ask you to type your questions. I also kindly ask you to uh, not ask questions specifically related to admissions. Um, today we want to really use this time to talk to our students about their experience of the program, how they decided to you know, join, join our university, and how are they finding studying molecular biology and genetics, as well as other questions you may have in mind. We have other webinars already recorded and available on our YouTube channel, and we will be doing more webinars in the future about our undergraduate international admissions process. So I kindly ask you to refer to those. So with that, let's get started very briefly. Um, we are located in Turkey, in Istanbul. Istanbul is a very big city of about 16 million people, and it's always referred to as a bridge between Europe and Asia or East and West. We are particularly located on the European or Western part of the city, very close uh, in the North part to the Black Sea. So from our campus, you can actually see the Black Sea and the third bridge over the Bosphorus. So I invite you to, you know, just go on Google and start searching Koch University so you can find our exact location and see the surroundings. This is one of the things that I love about working here, which is the campus environment is absolutely beautiful. We are surrounded by pristine, well, not pristine, <laughs> but very green and uh, clean air forests and with the beautiful sea on the back. So it is a very relaxed environment, perfect for those who like a quiet and calm uh, type of atmosphere. We also have a Koch University hospital, each, and that's where we have our School of Medicine and our graduate school of health sciences, but that is located in a different part of the city. So Koch University was set up in 1993 as a research intensive university. We're a foundation university, so we're not a public university, we're a private but non-for-profit non university. And from the beginning, we were set up to be a center of excellence that would provide world-class education to Turkish students and to create new knowledge but for the benefit of society, not only of Turkey, but of the whole world. And this is the vision that we have in terms of the work that we're doing. Later on, as a university um, you know, grew in terms of the number of professors, programs, students, then internationalization of our student body became um, a strategic pri priority. And this is why we're here, because we have um, started welcoming undergraduate international students to our program for several years now. And they bring a lot of value to the class, uh, you know, our cohorts and to our campus life. Um, we have seven colleges. We're going to talk specifically about one of them today. Those seven colleges offer 22 undergraduate programs, and those programs are taught by our full-time faculty. These are professors, also lecturers. Right now we have about 521 full-time faculty and approximately over 8,000 students. So as I was mentioning, this is just to give you an overview of our, our whole university in terms of the colleges that we have and our programs. Today, we're gonna to talk about the College of Sciences where we offer four specific majors, which is chemistry, physics, mathematics, and molecular biology and genetics, which is the one that is um, our main focus for today. Besides the academic or curricular curricular offer of Coach University is very important also to know our extracurricular support for students, especially for freshmen or first year students. This is a crucial year in your transition from high school to university life. Um, and you are able to see all of the details about each of these offices on our website. However, I just wanted to very quickly highlight the fact that we are one of the few universities in Turkey that has an international community office that it's fully dedicated to providing support to international students. So that's with very practical things before you arrive, such as your visa in case you need a visa, your student residence permit. And then once you're here advising you in terms of um, you know, how to learn Turkish, how to make friends, they organize some activities for new international students, or anytime you have any kind of issue that you need help with, they're the people that you can go to. 
So what we offer at Coach University is a liberal arts education. That means uh, for programs, for example, in the College of Science, that uh, they are offered in a four-year curriculum. Uh, when we mean year, we talk about two semesters, which is the fall and the spring semester. There's also a summer semester where students can take courses if, if they wish. In the first year, the freshman year, all students have to go through the core program. So this comprises seven areas of knowledge and it's aimed to also help develop specific com competencies that we think every professional should have as they enter you know, industry or academia in the future. This is a really enriching experience because it means that besides your, for example, molecular biology and genetics courses, you will also be exposed and learn about other areas of human knowledge. So that would be in the humanities, in the social sciences, other basic sciences, uh, in um, computer engineering, for example. So it's a really nice way to round up all of your different knowledge. There's also the opportunity to do double majors, which means that you graduate with two different diplomas, um, minors, certificate programs, some colleges offer specific certificate or track programs. And this is very important. We offer a lot of opportunities to do exchange semesters at other universities outside of Turkey. Um, in the case of European Union member countries, this means that you also receive financial support to cover your living costs whilst you're a student. And if you decide to do an exchange somewhere outside of the European Union, there are also financial support opportunities based on merit. So now let's talk about the College of Sciences at Koch University. Um, this college was actually set up right from the beginning uh, since our university started. And its mission has always been to educate future leaders who will design strategies based on scientific principles and do cutting edge research with, with high impact. So there are some specific principles that all of the deans who have served in this college always uh, have held up for both the teaching and research activities in the college, which is we need to make sure that our graduates have in-depth fundamental knowledge of the areas they're learning, but that they also know and um, understand what are the ethical and professional standards that they should um, abide by once they enter industry or, or academia. Um, the third point that you see on the slide, I think it's extremely important, especially for those of you considering molecular biology and genetics, which is, you know, instilling in, in our students an appreciation and uh, um, an appetite for lifelong learning and growth, especially in an area like genetics and biology, where every year things are advancing and changing and the knowledge you have may, may have completely changed after five years. Uh, so, you know, the, the capacity to always be a student, regardless of how long ago you graduated is extremely important. And finally, something that permeates across all of our different colleges and, and graduate schools at the university, which is to have an interdisciplinary perspective. It's a recognition that complex problems are rarely solved by a single uh, professional branch or discipline or area of knowledge. It takes the cooperation and collaboration and discussion and arguments between different professionals and different areas of knowledge to really solve, solve very complex issues. Here we're talking about things like um, climate change, like inequality, like hunger, like, you know, and, and that, that's why I'm also excited to, to have Professor Ismail with us today, because I'm gonna ask him some questions about this. So in terms of numbers, like uh, who is the College of Science? So the College of Science uh, hosts 44 faculty members, um, nearly 300 undergraduate students. That number uh, doesn't change dramatically year on year, but it has seen a steady increase in the past 10 years. It's one of our very prolific colleges in terms of its research, not only in terms of the volume, the number of publications that our faculty member members uh, publish every year. So for example, in 2021, this was 141 scientific publications in the top uh, journals in, in their respective fields, such as physics, chemistry, um, biology, genetics, ecology. Um, it's an average of 3.21 publications per faculty member. That's quite high within the context of Turkey and even regionally, especially regionally. Um, it's also a high impact research when you look at the number of other researchers who are then quoting our professors' work in their work um, to help advance you know, un an understanding of a specific topic. 
We also, the College of Science also hosts several national and international research projects. And this is a big opportunity about being a student, an undergraduate student in this college. Part of those projects are two European Research Council grants. These are extremely competitive, meaning very difficult to obtain grants because you're competing against individual researchers all across Europe from very, very big um, research powerhouses such as the UK, the Netherlands, Germany. So the fact that we have two of those just in the College of Science, it's a, it's a big achievement and it's an opportunity again for undergraduate students. We'll talk about the laboratories in more detail when we come to the when we come to talk about molecular biology and genetics. One of the things that I've always been impressed about this college uh, is the fact that uh, undergraduate students start to publish from the from from the moment that they're students. They don't have to wait until they have graduated and become a master or PhD student. So last year, for example, in 2021 nine of our students appeared as co-authors in articles that were published in leading international journals. This is great. I mean, when you think about your future um, paths in academia, or especially those of you considering then a master's or a PhD program. The college also helps to organize an annual science and engineering day in cooperation with our College of Engineering, which is a great opportunity to showcase uh, our senior students final projects and uh, the colleges invite members of industry who then examine the projects, interview and meet with the project teams. And it's a great opportunity as well to find good you know, internships or future job positions. We also have several student clubs and societies which are related to genetics, to science, to maths and many more. But this is something that I will particularly want to ask our student panel today. Here is just a sample of uh, some of the topics or the article titles of our undergraduate students who published in scientific publications last year and uh, which faculty members they work with. Another big uh, kind of, I think, big opportunity about being a student in the College of Sciences is the opportunity, as I mentioned, to do double major. So right now, approximately 9% of our College of Science students are doing double majors. And when you look at which colleges they're doing the second major in, the biggest group is in the College of Engineering. So these are students who may be combining, for example, mathematics with computer engineering or molecular bio biology, and they're studying computer engineering at the same time. There's others who choose our College of Administrative Sciences and Economics, that, that's the great green bubble that you see there. And there are uh, 20, sorry about the, um, the number is a bit mixed there, uh, in our College of Social Sciences and Humanities. And what this points out is that you may start your academic journey as a university student in a science program, but you have four or more years to actually explore a lot more and graduate with two diplomas, and it can be in an area completely different uh, than, than the first one. It's also a college that has accumulated a lot of awards, both national and international over the years. Just in 2021, for example, um, Associate Professor Elif Nur Firat Karalar, she won two awards and she's also the, uh, she hosts two uh, European Molecular Biology EMBO awards. I'm, I'm, I may have the acronym wrong, I apologize for that. Uh, but, you know, again, these are great opportunities for undergraduate students to become involved in research from early on. There are some central laboratories which are under the, the coordination of the College of Science. This includes in areas like surface science and technology, our proteomics facility, um, our energy center, and others like translational, translational medicine. This is a huge new research center in Turkey and in the region uh, with very large amount of funding and that it combines professionals and researchers from lots of different disciplines, including molecular biology and genetics. So now we're gonna talk about our program, why we're here today. So molecular biology and genetics, uh, it's a four year program is offered in English at Koch University. And we have nine faculty members who are responsible for teaching the, the required or core courses in the program. Um, there are now 207 students across all different years of the program. 36 of those students are doing double majors. There are seven research laboratories, which I will show in a minute. 
Um, in 2021, there were 21 alumni who graduated from the program. I put here uh, something that caught my attention when I was listening to uh, a series of uh, podcast videos that we did at the end of last year with different professors from our colleges talking about each of the programs. And uh, Professor Hassan Demirji from Molecular Biology and Genetics was saying that someone, for someone studying molecular biology and genetics at Koch University, the sky is the limit because the amount of facilities um, and state-of-the-art laboratory equipment and materials that are available, as well as the quality of the professors that we have in that department is such that really we are light years ahead of any other department in Turkey, in the whole region, and even you know, in direct, I wouldn't say competition, but very comparable to the quality that you would expect at places where he had worked as a researcher before, such as standard. Uh, Stanford, sorry. So um, this really caught my attention because um, it, you know it's one of those hidden gems that you don't expect to find in in not like brand name universities, but in our case, this is really a diamond program that we have at Koch University. In terms of what do you learn as a molecular biology and genetics student? So the whole program is designed around the understanding that we are constantly discovering new technologies and new discoveries of how molecules, cells, tissues, and organisms work and how we can use that understanding to diagnose and treat human disease as well as other organisms, not only human, but also um, other living organisms. So the core courses or the core knowledge that you will gain as a molecular biology and genetics students cover the main branches of biology, which are biochemistry, molecular biology, genetics, cell biology, developmental biology. But then there are also elective courses. Um, if you want to focus, if you have specific curiosity about areas such as cancer biology, neuroscience, proteomics, bioinformatics. So these are all extremely, um, you know, I wouldn't say in demand, but they're extremely interesting areas because there's, as I said, constant new discoveries uh, on, a, on a very fast pace that make it a very exciting field to, to become very knowledgeable about. When we look at the laboratories associated with our molecular biology and genetics program, I have listed them here and you can see who are the PIs, the principal investigators in those laboratories. So as you can see, it covers areas like um, proteomics, like centrosomes, this is uh, Professor Firat Karalar's center, RNA, molecular neurobiology, as well as some central labs. When we look at the curriculum of the program, I'm not gonna go through every year. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what, for example, the first year of life as a molecular biology and genetics students would look like. You see that it's not only biology or gen you know, genetics related courses. There's also other areas, which is what I was referring to as our core program that all students have to take. So this includes things like academic and life skills, which is a very important you know, part of that you know, making sure that you succeed in that transition into university life, academic writing, which is an essential skill as a university student. And then you also see things like calculus um, and um, computer, you know, kind of computer skills. In the second semester, for example, we continue with courses related to academic writing. Uh, you start learning, for example, Python in terms of programming. Those of you who have already started to learn that, that's great, that's a plus algebra, um, and then of course more uh, biology related courses, as well as we start to see some of the um, laboratory courses. So I invite you to check our program website because that's where you can see what courses are required in each semester until you graduate in your senior year. And you can also see the description of the courses and you can see the, the, um, the order in which they are offered. This is just an example that besides the courses that you would you know, attend your classes for, there's always different seminars that are organized by the College of Science for all of the programs. I just picked here a sample from the last semester from fall 2021, um, which are seminars with invited professors or researchers from different areas. So you can see here, uh, one, of the, you know, one of the upsides of the pandemic is that of course during 2020 and 2021, 
we were able to bring actually more speakers to our university because they would participate remotely and this kind of reduced the barriers to bring very talented and very um, you know respected uh, speakers in different topics so this is just a sample of the webinars okay so i want to make sure we have a lot of time for our questions i think we're doing well for time so I'm going to ask now our panel of students and our professor to please open your cameras and I'll open the active speaker view as well. So as I mentioned, uh, what I'm gonna ask is each of you, if you can, um, as I mentioned your name, if you can open your microphone and briefly introduce yourself in terms of um, where are you from, where uh, have you studied before, and what year you're in the program, uh, in the case of Professor Salam, of course, we would want to know about your research and about the courses you're teaching and your journey to coach. And then I will start to check the questions on the Q&A panel and the chat, and I will start moderating the Q&A session. So with that, I would first like to ask Professor uh, Salam to introduce himself. All right, um, I'm hoping you can all hear me just fine. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, my name is Ismail Kudret Salam, and I'm. this is my third year at Koch University. I joined here at um, roughly around December 2018, so somewhere in 2019, I joined Koch University. Before that, um, I graduated, I did my PhD in Ankara in Hajitepe University, um, jointly with uh, University of California, Riverside. And after that, I uh, did a postdoc, three-year postdoc or four-year postdoc at UC Davis, where I studied mostly genomics uh, and evolutionary genetics. And then I moved to the University of Utah, uh, where I used my knowledge about evolutionary dynamics and evolutionary genomics to solve problems in conservation biology. And uh, that to this day has been the main topic of my research. So uh, officially I'm a professor of genetics and I study both genomics and population genetic theory. And what we aim in my lab or in my research is to understand the genetic changes that are responsible for divergence and adaptation of natural populations to changing environments. So how, when environments change, how do organisms adapt to that? And what are the genome level changes that allow organisms to adapt to these changing environments? So it's all about how the environment changes or when the environment changes, what organisms do to actually survive and adapt to that and the genomic architecture. So every type of genomic change that enables organisms to survive and adapt to these environments is, uh, what is studied in my lab, and we use a bunch of different methods. We all we work with natural populations, so we go sample from nature. We work with real populations, um, different organisms. We work with fish, uh, with bears, with wolves, uh, with insects, several different insects. So we we heavily sample from natural populations and try to understand the dynamics of natural populations through using genetic data and genomic data, but we also utilize experimental populations. So we have experimental model organisms running in the lab so that we can follow uh, how they change through time to environments that we manipulate and we change so we can actually track that experimentally as well. So those are the type of um, experiments that are going or the type of studies that is happening in uh, our lab. And we use all types of data, like any kind of omics data, whether it be genomics, transcriptomics, or proteomics, we work in our lab. It's, uh, it's based on both field research. We do a little sampling in the field, some experimental work, but mostly we, we do computational biology. So we use uh, modern computational techniques like coding, and uh, scripting to actually understand the complex patterns that are uh, emerging in the genome as environments uh, change. Uh, right now, we're also we're working with, for example, wild bears, and we're looking at how wildlife actually adapts to urban environments, to the environments that we humans are creating, and we're tracking evolutionary changes in those organisms, and we're discovering really uh, nice adaptations and genetics. Uh, architecture of these adaptations. We, we actually know today, for example, in wild bears in east of Turkey, we can actually see that we have um, 
genomic changes, genomic adaptive changes that enable organisms to actually feed off human resources that actually, um, so they can actually utilize those resources better. So those are the type of uh, research that is uh, done in my lab. I also teach um, two core courses. So I teach genetics. So the core course in genetics is one of the courses that I teach. And the second core course I teach is genomics and bioinformatics. So those are like the two core courses that if you join uh, the molecular biology department, you'll be that those are required courses, you will have to take that. I also have an elective course, which is the fundamentals of evolutionary biology. So for those students who are interested in evolutionary biology in general, uh, you can take that as an elective uh, course. So um, that, that's basically about me. I've been here for three years and it's been wonderful. And I'm looking forward to uh, meeting uh, a lot of new students and seeing like them progress through uh, academic success, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Salam. That's that's fascinating. I think the work that you're doing is so crucial given you know what we need to adapt to in terms of climate change that yeah, we need all the data and understanding we can for all lots of different populations. I also read that you were working on topics related to in, in danger, but commercially um, critical kind of important fish uh, species and I thought well that's that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. That or a big grant hopefully that we'll get that will be able to both genotype and like both genomic data and transcriptome data for about 16 commercial fish species in Turkey so if that comes we'll, we'll, that'll be like a huge project for all the important uh, fish species here so we'll see Great. As part of those projects, um, does that involve, you know, like secondary data or primary data, as you were saying that in terms of, um, like, for example, in, in that project, how would this is just, I'm, I'm jumping ahead into a question I had in my mind when I read that it's how, for example, an undergraduate student could be involved as a research assistant in a project like that, for example, what type of tasks so, they would have, um, you know, that they would be responsible for as individually or as part of it. As a, yeah, so uh, what would happen is just like in any basic lab, there are several steps to doing research. We, we have lab work, which is basically um, purifying DNA. So we have natural... So we, what we do is, for example, we, we need DNA. So we bring in tissue, we bring in tissues from organisms. We hardly ever kill anything. So if you're interested, we, we just sample, for example, if it's fish, we sample a small portion of the fin. If it's mammals, we take uh, some blood. Um, so we don't actually kill the organism. We take sample tissues and we extract DNA from them. And most of this is done in, in laboratory. Then we prepare them for sequencing. We send them out for sequencing and then we get genetic or transcriptomic or omics data back. And then it's more computer work where we actually analyze that massive data and students can join in any part of this. Oh, I think you, your microphone. Turn more computational. Oh, Gemma, I think your microphone uh got muted yes now yeah. I... now we can hear you yes oh okay sorry about that so where did i drop off um uh, i heard everything so okay so it might be my connection so apologies <laughs> okay um so yeah for example uh, you know we have students that join in any part of the helping with uh, laboratory work, but we also have students who are very interested in computational uh, methods and they're also helping in that. So again, it just it just depends on what the student is interested in, but we we let them go as far as possible. It's true for any lab. You, you will start out uh, as a trainee, you will try to get a feel for the lab, and as you progress, as your knowledge and understanding grows, you'll get more responsibilities. And, you know, again, as Hassan Demerji, my fellow, you know, uh, faculty member here said, it's the sky's the limit. It, it really depends on what the students want to do. There really are no limits. Um, and again, we always have graduate students as well in the lab that are very happy to help and um, supervise students. They do more of the supervision than us. We don't really have that much time. But uh, as I said, labs are always very um, lively environments where having like feeling that atmosphere is very important and you'll learn a lot. 
it's also important for you to sample different labs because every lab is not going to be for you. And the only way to learn, learn which research is for you or not is to actually go in the lab and try to breathe in that atmosphere, understand what type of research is going, which will also enable you to understand, you know, which areas, uh, you know, which areas you're interested in. So again, yeah, it's, it's very important that you actually do join labs. Great, thank you so much. That was really um, illustrative and, and clear. Um, I'm going to now ask uh, each of our panel members or students to introduce themselves. So um, if I can first ask, ask Raul Abdullayev to you know, open your camera and your microphone and introduce yourself. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Raul, uh, I am 19 and um, it's written here that I'm a senior. I am technically a senior because what year you are in the system is based on the number of courses you've taken, but practically I'm in my third year, so I'm a junior. I just took more <laughs> courses that I'm supposed to. Um, so I'm a junior in molecular biology, um, double majoring with chemistry. I am uh, originally from Azerbaijan. Uh, my high school education was also done in Azerbaijan, and then I came here for my undergraduate studies. Great. Thank you very much, Raul. I'm going to ask now Camila Bazarbek to please introduce herself. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Camila, and as Raul uh, said about his age, I'm 21. Um, in my junior year, we were enrolled with Raul at the same year, 2019. And uh, uh, I'm from Kazakhstan. I graduated school in Kazakhstan. I got my IV diploma there. It really helped me here, by the way. Uh, or if you're not really proficient in English, you can take an ELC year in our university, or you can start straight away with the first year. So I think I'm going too deep. No, so no, I'll that's, let that's others excellent. To introduce themselves. Yeah. Excellent introduction, okay. Camille. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now ask uh, Jana Kader. Oh, that's sorry. Uh, to introduce yourself. So, hello everyone. My name is Jenna, and sorry for the alarm. I guess there's something in my building. Um, I'm a second year student. I'm Palestinian. Uh, my high school was in Lebanon, and then I come here for my undergraduate program I'm in molecular biology and genetics department, and this is my second year. But actually, it's my first year here in campus. Exactly. So you're part of the, the COVID, the Corona kind of remote learning cohort. So I'm, I have a question for all of you about this um, that I'm leaving towards the end. Thank you so much, Jana. Um, I'm going to ask now Fawaz to please introduce himself. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fawaz, and I'm uh, actually I'm a sophomore. Okay. I'm not a freshman. You're getting the years I, wrong. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't get the credits enough to be considered a sophomore, so uh, I, I'm getting I'm getting that fixed. And I'm from Indonesia, and uh, I attended high school in a public high school uh, in Indonesia in a local curriculum, and um, it's actually been easier to adjust with the. Uh, um, curriculum here because the Turkish curriculum and the Indonesian curriculum are very similar. So, great, it's very good to know. Thank you, Fawaz. And last but not least, I would like now to ask now uh, Kamala Karimluk to please introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Please. My name is uh, Kamala Karimluk, and I'm from Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, I'm a freshman student majoring in molecular biology and genetics, and I've also graduated from high school in Azerbaijan. Uh, I'm 18. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kamala. So uh, thank you again to our panel. I'm checking now the question and answer section. So I'm going to start with some of the questions. Um, and from our student panel, if you would like to start, please directly open your microphone and you can start to provide your opinion or, or answer on this. So um, the first question from Aisha was, are you doing a dual degree on any other subject? What would you say about your experience so far? I think from our panel today, only Raul is doing a double degree. So if, if I'm not wrong, so maybe if Raul can help us answer that. What has been your experience so far in doing a double degree? Sure. Uh, so I'm doing a double major with chemistry, which is really 
the easiest double major you can do if you're a molecular biology student because um, three courses overlap anyway and you have fewer requirements to complete um, and in general the subjects are similar but uh, if you look at and i think this was shown in the presentation what kind of double majors students do my friends do double majors in physics international relations psychology so um, really all kinds of mixes come into play here um, as to how it is well it's definitely more challenging than if you don't do double major because uh, for example, if you opt for molecular biology electives instead of double majors, you won't have as many lab components and lab components take a lot of time. So you would have to put in more time uh, into students, student labs from the chemistry department. But at the same time, coach curriculum is very flexible. So in your fourth year, you're not required to take almost any course. Everything is an elective. And if you put chemistry courses into those elective slots, then they're counted both towards your chemistry double major and towards the elective requirements of molecular biology. So um, that kind of helps to combine both subjects. And even if you're not in time to do it in four years, your scholarship ex is extended for the fifth year instead of your, in, in case you're double majoring so that um, you can complete it. So um, I think it's um, very much doable, but again, um, it's gonna take more effort because there are more lab reports to write. Thank you very much, Raul. Um, there are some very practical, useful tips there. So that's, uh, I didn't know about that in the fourth year. So that's, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing your, your experience. And yes, I can imagine that it must be challenging <laughs> to say the least. So there is a question from, Jansu about uh, admission. So I'm going to kindly ask you to, uh, um, you know, if you haven't gotten a response yet and you wrote to study at ku.edu.tr, we will double check. Um, I will also show our contact details for international students at the end of the webinar before we finish, uh, just to make sure that you have written to that email address. There is a question here, which I, I will ask both um, Professor Salam and some of our students uh, who may know from their peers who have already graduated, but it's about what type of job opportunities, especially in Turkey, are open for someone who has their bachelor's in molecular biology and genetics. So um, from our students, would you like to provide an opinion in terms of information you have? I know you haven't graduated yet, but uh, the information you have, for example, from peers or from your professors, No volunteers on this. Okay. Um, in terms of actual hard data, we do have information. That information is actually collected by our Career Development Center. They do a survey of our uh, students after they after they graduate, uh, two years after, and they ask them, you know, what are you doing now? Did you uh, pursue a job in industry after graduation, or are you doing a master's or a PhD? And where are you? What are you doing, etc. So. The data from that survey is available on their website. I will type the question on the chat also before we finish if you want to see it. Um, it's, it's not as granular as to see for molecular biology and genetics, but um, as far as I know, a lot of the employers in Turkey are related to pharmaceutical companies. Um, there's also employers in terms of government organizations and um, I think also there are some there may be some uh, foundations that are working on research that would be employers of people with a molecular biology and genetics degree. Here I would maybe ask Professor Salam if you have any information about previous students that you have uh, taught and where they are working now, um, or if they have pursued graduate study. Yeah, I, can, I can give some numbers uh, that would help. Uh, in this case, for example, so the good part about um, our alumni is that uh, we have a very high record for um, for alumni that are actually uh, employed after they leave uh, Coach University. So um, we only have about, uh, I think, 2% of our alumni actually are unemployed. So uh, at least 
through the time that I have been here and when we did this survey, only about 2% of our graduates didn't really get a job out of the university. So that's that's actually very high rate. So again, once you graduate from molecular biology, the university at Koch, uh, most of our students find a job this way or that. Of course, most of these jobs, since um, molecular biology is actually a core science, most of um, our alumni go into graduate studies. So uh, about 61% of our graduates actually do a master's, about 40% of these then follow up to do a PhD. So somewhere around that time, those are the numbers. Uh, and 56% of these that actually do uh, have a career as a PhD or complete their PhD actually stay in academia. So they actually find faculty jobs. So that's a pretty high rate um, if you, if you uh, factoring how competitive the molecular biology uh, faculty positions are around the world. And this is not just um, Turkish faculty positions, faculty positions both in Europe and the United States and other, other regions of the world. So that's a pretty high success rate when it comes to academic uh, jobs. Uh, but other than that, uh, actually 42% of our alumni are actually employed either in the private or public uh, sector. Most of the, I think about 30% of these are in R&D or education. So they're either teaching in colleges or teaching in high school or uh, teaching jobs, or um, they're actually uh, either in pharmaceutical labs or in different type of uh, research facilities, they do basic R&D research. So again, uh, when you think of R&D research, you might say molecular biology is limited, but it actually is not. Today, most private sectors, like most hospitals, uh, most pharmaceutical companies, mo most um, military, like even military institutions, or um, how should I say, basic like uh, chemical plants, uh, chemical research, uh, any kind of industry actually has a molecular biology uh, research uh, uh, research foundation, and they do have uh, research opportunities there. And our alumni actually do work in these uh, jobs. So again, uh, also we're like both in Turkey and around the world, biotechnology or biotechnology companies are actually increasing, and they also uh, demand molecular and biology genetic. Uh, graduates. So again, there's a lot of uh, good job opportunities there. And in actually, in Turkey, job opportunities, especially in biotechno uh, biotechnology firms, is really increasing. There's like huge boom of these type of sectors uh, in Turkey right now. So and they are looking for a lot of uh, new uh, molecular biology graduates. Um, there's also a lot of um, genetic disease typing centers, so centers that actually do genetic screens for certain diseases or so for certain, um, uh, let's say, familial diseases or familiar sicknesses. Again, those those types of companies are really increasing in number. And again, they, they demand heavily good uh, molecular and biology and genetic majors. So those are some of uh, the areas. Uh, so R&D, research and education, drug industry, actually, we have about 23% of our alumni are actually find jobs in drug uh, industry. But we also have other fields as well. Like some of our, we have alumni that are, that have find employment in telecommunication, IT, the food industry, software development, journalism, architecture. Um, so we do also have about, you know, 20 to 19% of our employees, like alumni actually do find jobs in these other like non-biology major uh, fields uh, as well. So again, yeah, it's a, it's a very diverse field. It's a very growing field. Molecular and biology and genetics is in demand all over the world. And I, I can really say from our alumni that no one has that has graduated, nearly no one that's graduated from this um from this program uh, finds it that much difficult to find a job. It, it also depends on how you graduate. Again, the most important thing is Koch University, that degree you get from Koch University is in demand, but it also depends on how you graduate, how well you do here as well. If you do well here, we have lots of opportunities for you to do internships. So if you're looking for a career in a specific field, you can actually go intern in companies and uh, research facilities and hospitals and you know medical 
um, medical institutions, drug, um, you know, developing institutions, R&D institutions or educational institutions. And once you get your feet wet by internships, by meeting, by, you know, networking with those people, then it'll be easier for you to hunt jobs. And also you can use the network that we as faculty have here. We have a faculty which, you know, which, which heavily works with the private sector as well. A lot of our faculty actually have joint projects with uh, certain industrial companies or certain uh, R&D research facilities that are either in the private or uh, governmental sector. So again, you can use that network, you can use those connections to actually um, allocate yourself or you know find your way to a job after you uh, graduate. So again, I think there are lots of opportunities it's, it also depends on how much you want to use that. Again, university is not just about going to class, taking lessons and getting good grades. Yes, it is about that. Uh, I'm not one of those people who says that grades aren't important. Grades are super important. Never, never believe anyone who tells you, yeah, the grades are not important. Grades are important, but it's also important to know that university is exactly what it is. It's a universal place where there's lots of opportunities and you must be able to harness as much of those opportunities as possible. That means like, getting to know your professors, getting to know their contacts, getting to know their network, just making your way in to whatever goal that you find that you want to do after you graduate. So again, that's what university is about. It's about understanding the world, understanding how, you know, once you graduate, what you're going to do, all of the resources is there. It's all about you trying to grab them. So again, you have to be active. If you're passive, um, you know, again, you might have more of a difficult time, but if you're active, there's lots of opportunity. So, you know, don't really, I don't really understand people who say like molecular biology, there's not really job opportunities. If you look at our alumni, there are plenty of job opportunities and they, they get, um, they find jobs pretty easily. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Salam. That was yeah, great and thorough with data and, uh, you know, and experience. So thank you for that. There are some questions that I have just marked uh, not as answered. I'm moving them to the answered category uh, because they are related to our scholarships and admission related questions. So what I propose that we do is um, we will use this time until six, until you know the, the end of the hour to ask other questions to our students. And then those of you who would like to stay and learn more about the specific admission requirements, minimum grades, et cetera, you can stay on and I will do a presentation about this. I have some slides here with that information, but so that we don't take more time than necessary from our panel members. So there are some questions about biomedical engineering. Uh, if we provide biomedical engineering and what is the difference between biomedical engineering and molecular biology and genetics? Is it something, I guess, that Coach, a coach molecular biology and genetics students could um, learn about and then study uh, at a later stage. I think also for Professor Salam. <laughs> I know we don't offer biomedical engineering as a separate program. We don't, uh, but there's no, like we don't, it's not a separate program, but we do have um, biology and chemistry engineering, which is uh, pretty close to biomedical engineering. Um, we also have faculty members who directly work with biomedical institutions, both for drug related purposes or for um, mostly for drug related purposes for finding um, the mechanisms of drugs or targeted drug um, designs and all of that type of stuff, which is a part of biomedical engineering. Um, so again, yes, even though we don't really have a dedicated biomedical engineering uh, program here, you can offshoot into biomedical engineering uh, from the resources available at Koch University. We also have several faculty members who actually do participate in biomedical engineering in this way uh, or another. Uh, I, I also think that there's more opportunities in the medical school for biomedical engineering as well. But yes, it's not an official program, but there are research that, um, uh, that heavily participate or uh, that is heavily related with biomedical engineering. So you could move in towards a path. So one thing that I think students should understand is that Getting a degree in something doesn't mean that your career path is set into exactly that degree. 
Uh, so if you are a molecular and biology genetics major, there's no reason why you can't do a master's in biomedical engineering or a PhD in biomedical engineering. If you have, for example, a PhD in molecular biology and genetics, that does not mean you can't do a postdoc in biomedical engineering or then move to the field of biomedical engineering. Sciences are all related to each other. That's why we always teach the core sciences, meaning physics, chemistry, biology. These are the core sciences. And for engineering, you need mathematics, um, you know, you need statistics, you also need this for you know, the natural sciences as well. But those are the core things that you have to learn to branch off into these fields. So again, it doesn't mean just because you aren't graduating from a biomedical engineering uh, program, it doesn't mean you can't move into that. You still have, you know, it's important. So this was the thing I'm talking about. If you want a career in biomedical engineering, so you have to cater or you have to move your education towards that goal. You have to say, okay, what do I need for this career path? Okay, I'm going to graduate from molecular biology and genetics, but if I'm going to go to biomedical engineering, perhaps I need to take some engineering classes, like for example, chemical engineering or maybe physics. I need to know something about engineering. Maybe I need to know something about industry. So I have to take some courses about um, you know, industrial um, the workings or whatever. So again, it's all about you using the resources of this university for your goal. Again, there's nothing is going to be spoon fed. In life, nothing is spoon fed. You don't have like these picture perfect things that you have to do and that'll get you to biomedical engineering. It's all about you, uh, you know, kind of drawing that correct path and the resources are here. So if it's biomedical engineering, the resources are here. Uh, and it's available to you. It's all about you and finding that correct way. Thank you very much, Professor Salam. There is a question here for Camila, because you mentioned that you had graduated from an IB diploma uh, curriculum school. The question is how taking biology at higher level uh, has helped you at Coach University, if at all? That's wrong. Um, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, probably it helped me, but anyway, when you come to this university from the freshman year, each course starts from the very basics. Uh, for example, the first course that we have in biology, it explains everything that we had in HL biology and IB diploma programs. So that's why you shouldn't really worry about that. Even don't worry about your grade there. Don't worry about uh, do you remember everything or not. But actually, yes, of course, it helps if you study hard in your high school but also you're not losing anything if you didn't have that course in your high school program. Also, I wanted to add something about the biochemical engineering. I know every, uh, um, a lot of things was said, but uh, turning into the practical thing, like we have many labs that work on the drug delivery and during working, uh, pursuing your molecular biology and genetics degree, you can go to those labs. You can try different labs. For example, the lab I'm working right now in is the circadian clock lab. Uh, that's the chronobiology thing, the circadian cycle and stuff like that. And what we're working on is that the discovery of different drugs, small molecules that can affect the circadian cycle. And this kind of research is done in very different laboratories, both in chemical uh, chemistry department, also in biochemical engineering department. And also the main difference between biochemical engineering and Molecular biology and genetics, I think, is that the abundance of engineering courses in the biochemical engineering course, because you must have uh, physics courses and they're really tough. If you're ready for that, you can apply for the biochemical engineering courses. But if you're going to, if you want something easier, like really honestly, I think that molecular biology and genetics, genetics is easier if you don't like a lot of physics, a lot of engineering. So that might be the criteria to ch choose between these two, those two majors. But as Ojam said, like you're not losing anything if you choose any of this. You can always adjust your curriculum towards the one that you want. Thank you very yeah. much, Camila, for the honest, honest advice. Um, there is a general question. So this question I'm gonna put, uh, I would like all of our panel student members to answer. Uh, which I think it's great. It's um, someone who says, I'm excited to join this fall. So I guess you're one of our offer holders. Congratulations. And I was wondering if you have any tips on how to best prepare for my first year at the university. What do you wish somebody had told you so that, you know, or things that you said, yes, thank God I did this. <laughs> 
Uh, maybe we can start with Raul, like we go in order may go for, it. for someone who hasn't spoken before. Jana, yes. Okay, so like for the courses that you're gonna take, I don't think you're required to, to prepare anything, but it will be like so good for you if you prepare yourself in English, if you can speak, if you can understand. So it's just for improving your English language. You'll find it much more easier in, in the university, I mean like to adapt and to deal with courses if you are so good in English. That's my advice actually. Thank you, Jana. Uh, can I ask for another contribution on this? Maybe from Kamala, who hasn't participated yet. Um, uh, I agree that we have, you have to improve your English in terms of, of biological or science terms because there are plenty of them that you can come across during the lectures. And also it will be great if you have some uh, spare time and you can spend the time on just revising what you have learned in high school just the basics because it it would be a great fundam fundamental knowledge for you in the freshman year thank you Kamal. Uh, from raul do you have any tips yeah sure uh i actually didn't have good study habits back in high school so i have to had to completely revise them in my freshman year. What I can tell is that brute force learning doesn't work at university. At least it doesn't here because there's a lot of material. So you can't just sit and um, like in short period, work yourself through all the material. You need to approach it more methodically. You need to prioritize what's important, what's not. Uh, because if you try to do everything 100%, you won't have time for anything. So I think organiz organization and prioritization matters at university. That would be my advice. It's a great tip, Pro. So no, no, not crashing, you know, all the lectures the day before the midterms and finals, and you know when you have to present papers. So um, we also have, by the way, our office of learning and teaching, and I know they organize workshops uh, for our students about yeah, time management um you know like study skills essentially so that's something that you should definitely look into once you start at the university um i think we haven't heard from fawaz so fawaz what would be your tips for the you know first year at the university um personally i uh when i started university i really didn't have a problem with uh time management um but what i did have a problem was uh, just the sheer difficulty of all the core um, of all the core courses a molecular biology student has to take. Uh, for example, the first uh, course that really um, scared me in this university was Calculus One. And uh, so, what I would really recommend to any freshman that wants to come here is to quickly take AP classes so you can get rid of all those credits and. Uh, try to focus more and so you can focus more on your mbg major because um it's uh it's like it's not a very good experience uh to to have to um repeat all those subjects again so if you can try to get take ap classes or um try to transfer credit to get rid of those uh credits uh that will be probably the best advice i could give Thank you very much for us. Yes, we have had that feedback from students from I think every college calculus, uh, the first semester of calculus, it's it's a scary course. So that's a great tip to to revise before that. And there are some questions here. There are some questions which I'm going to move to the answered part and I'll cover them, which are about exchange programs. The question is if we are able to do exchange programs with universities, other you know, that Coach University has no agreements or partnerships with? The answer is yes, but the how is a bit complicated, so I will move it to my second part, okay? Um, there is a question here which I thought was interesting. How hard is it to learn the Turkish language as an international student? So I'm going to ask, um, I think, uh, perhaps Camila, Jana, Fawaz, to again, like, tell us their yeah, experience with that. Where, where are you in that journey? Like, when you are here in, in the campus, like, having Turkish friends, it's, like, pretty easier to learn the Turkish language. Like, if you 
if you're gonna know like what's the meaning of this word, you can ask your friend, you can ask your professor even, and you can learn it like more easier than being or watching videos on YouTube, for example, or taking a course before you come to Turkey. Like what I have to say, like uh, having the experience of living in the country, it's pretty like a good way to help you to learn the Turkish language. Thank you, Jan. Um, Camila, where are you on yes, your I journey with Turkish? Um, now I'm on the journey, like I can tell what I want, but I can't really contribute to the conversation between my friends, but I quite understand like maybe 30% of what they're saying, but I didn't put any, like a lot of effort into learning Turkish. It just happened naturally to me. But what I, I really advise you to maybe if you have an opportunity to take a course of Turkish before you come here, because it's, it's going to make your life like funnier, really. You're going to understand some inside jokes between the Turkish classmates you have or other stuff like that. And also Turkish helps when you go out to the city. Of course, in the campus, you don't need Turkish at all because everyone here is proficient in English. So that's not a problem. However, it brings many advantages to you too. Oh, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Fawaz, if I can ask for your tips or, you know, like what has been your experience in learning Turkish? Um, I'd say the uh, for, for Turkish, I recommend you come here with at least uh, a one level of uh, knowledge. And then um, if you know at least A1, uh, it's really easy for you to build up on your knowledge because you already understand a couple of the words and you just have to fill in the little nuances. Uh, so that's what I did. I finished um, A1 at least before I came here. And so learning Turkish was a pretty uh, like uh, easy journey. All I did to learn Turkish was I used to do a lingo course. That's already more than enough for you to survive here. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not asking Raul and Kamala because we're, they're from Azerbaijan and it doesn't mean you automatically know Turkish, but I do also know from our other Azerbaijani students that Turkish comes uh, in terms of learning it. It's fairly, you know, it's a smoother kind of process and for um, students whose native language is, is not, you know, um, Azerbaijan. So because of time, this is why I'm just checking the questions here. Um, there is a great question here. What would you suggest to an applicant who is unsure about picking their major? So this is this is something we see often that people may be considering molecular biology and genetics, but also something else. It could be chemistry, it could be medicine. Uh, so for for our student panel, what was your decision process like if you were not sure about picking a major? I may try to answer this question because uh, when I was uh, thinking about this, I was between molecular biology and genetics and uh, chemical and biological engineering. Uh, when I was researching about this, I was not really sure about the details and it really helped me to look what the course is about, what lessons I'm going to take if uh, I apply for this course. and. Uh, also, I've searched on the internet, uh, what specifically can I do after graduating? And doing this kind of stuff really helped me to decide uh, on molecular biology and genetics because engineering, uh, I think uh, someone mentioned that there, there is much more physics lessons you have to take. It's uh, more about chemistry and engineering while molecular biology and genetics, it's more focused on biology and there is not much about uh, physics or engineering here. So it really helped me. Thank you, Kamala. Excellent. Any other of our student panelists would like to offer their insights on this if you were not sure when you were applying? Maybe I can. Yeah, I can try. Thank you. Kamala. I have a friend who came here as a molecular biology and genetics student, but then after one year, she just changed her major. So that's what you can do. That's why I really advise you to keep looking for other uh, majors too here. Also, we have a great, you have a great opportunity of having friends from other majors because we have a lot of them. And so you can decide at the end of the first year too and just transfer from one major to another. Or just check the curriculums. They're all in the websites. 
you can check all four years, all the subjects, and I think that will be enough for you to choose probably. Thank you very much, Camila. Uh, there is a question for Professor Salam, which I think is gonna take some time, which is about the field of epigenomics. Um, so like, maybe I will ask Kurai if you can um, hold that question. And if Professor Salam has time to explain that, if you would like to stay, because I don't want to take more than the time that I asked you to, to make for this. That question is... So it says, um, what are your thoughts on the field of epigenomics? Do, do you think, are they better at explaining aging than the telomere breakdown theory? I'll just say this. We can't really go into... Okay, the, <laughs> sorry. But I think what, what I can actually say there is very easily, it's not a, either this or that question. It's it's how does epigenetics and telomere and the theory around it, they work together for aging. So it's it's not this or that explains it better. Those are like, those are not mutually exclusive processes. Like telomeres are also a type of epigenetical marker as well. So it's not, there's, those are not exclusive things. They're, they're just like pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to solve. So again, I think that's the best thing I can get. It's not like that or this. Theories don't, again, it's, it's all like telomeres are also epigenetic in some sort of way. So again, can't really go into a long lecture on this topic, but we do discuss in my genetics class. So if you're here, then uh, yeah, we, we, we go over most of that uh, there as well, like at least some of that. So again, but the important thing is they both play a part. It's not one is and the other is not. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there was a comment in the chat asking for the webinar recording. Yes, we are recording the webinar and all of you who have registered will receive it via email by end of tomorrow. We will also upload it to our, our YouTube channel and you can watch it there anytime. But you will have the link on an email from Zoom uh, thanking you for your participation in the webinar. Um, there, is a, there is a quick question. Do the lecturers have any dress codes in particular they want to see students in? As far as I know, no. We're pretty kind of free environment in terms of how people want to dress. So I, I've, I've considered that answered. Um, what would you say about your application timeline? What you what would you suggest to an applicant? This is for our students. So how far in advance you started preparing your application? What things you wish you had done earlier? Or you know, if there's any kind of practical tips about what you need to do to enter the university that you want to share with the students, that would be great. Yeah, uh, so maybe I can say something. Uh, my advice is uh, that you apply as soon as possible because um, as far as I know, there are several admission cycles and in every admission cycle, a portion of the scholarships is given. So the earlier you apply, the more chances you have of getting a scholarship. Um, so yeah, th that, would be, that would be a good tip, I think. Thank you, Raul. Anyone else? Any tips from, that you may remember from your application period preparing for the SATs. There was also a question, I think, for our students from Kazakhstan, if you enter the university through the ENT or SAT. Uh, but as, as, as far as I know, I think for Camila, you applied with your IV diploma. That... Yes, I applied with my, I applied both my IV diploma and SAT results. Ah. But as far as I know, now you also can uh, apply with ENT results. Exactly. It's like Kazakhstan test. Yes. yes, right. But I don't really know about the details about that because back then it wasn't like that. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a new uh, eligible test from this year for students from Kazakhstan. I'll talk about it um, after this. Finally, uh, how easy would it be for someone to balance sports and academics when doing molecular biology and genetics for any of our students who are maybe practicing an individual or team sports, you know, competitively or as a hobby for your, you know, enjoyment? Is anyone active in sports that can share their experience? Uh, I used to go gym, by the way. Your what, sorry? Gym. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it's so possible. Can yeah, yeah, it's possible for sure. Like you can manage your time, uh, depend on your, for example, lessons and your assignments and your midterms. Uh, I guess you can, you can do that. Great. Yes. So let me add that. Uh, I go to the gym uh, four times a week uh, regularly. 
Uh, and um, what can I see is that it's definitely possible, but something that ties in with what I said previously, uh, there's like, if you're idealistic, there's really never um, time. Um, you just have to make time. So uh, there comes a point where you say to yourself, okay, I've learned this to an optimal degree and now I have to move on and do different stuff to have a balanced way of life, be that reading extracurricularly, be that going to the gym. So always keep that in mind. Don't push yourself to do 100% of everything because then you're just gonna spend 100% of your time in front of the textbooks. So my advice is 93% um, of the whole job is enough and the rest you can dedicate to sports and um, other stuff and then it's very much doable. Thank you very much, Raul. There are three questions here. There is one that I will put to all of our panels to wrap up. And then I, I, I really see you back into your, your you know, activities for the afternoon. Um, the other two, I will answer in the next part when I continue. So as a wrap up, how has been your experience in your time at Coach University? You know, highlights or summary, you know, in a phrase, up to you, who would like to start? Maybe I'll start from Bonda, from Kamala, our freshman who has been here the shortest, as well as Fawaz. So, well, I'm having great time. Uh, I'm staying uh, in the dormitory and uh, I'm in the campus. So there are opportunities for everyone uh, for different interests. I mean, uh, there are coffee shops, uh, you can study there, you can study in the library, there are specific quiet areas, even not the library, but uh, comfortable areas where you can study too. Uh, you can uh, sit with your friends, chat. Uh, so I think I'm having great time in summary. Thank you, Kemal. Uh, Fawaz, what about what's been your experience so far at the university? Um, I'd say my experience, uh, what has been uh, very, um, well, it's been uh, quite good, I'd say. Uh, in a college university, I, I got I get to experience a very academic lifestyle. But then uh, once holidays arrive, Istanbul is, uh, I'd say, maybe like a two hour uh, bus right away. And so you're able to focus more on your studies during the time when it's um, not a holiday, but in the holiday, you're free to do, uh, to go sightseeing, uh, to go around Istanbul. It's never really a, a boring moment in Istanbul because you don't visit it that often either. So I'd say it's a good balance between both. Thank you, Philip. That's a, that's a great tip as well. Uh, Jana, now that you are you know, in your second year, what's been your experience like at Coach University? Um, I'm going to speak about my experience, like with the online learning and coming here to campus. Thank so, you. yeah, so my first year, like, as I said, it was online. So I didn't have the opportunity actually to live the, the university vibes or to be here in campus or even academically, like I didn't have the opportunity to go to labs, to meet the professors, uh, even meet my friends and ask, ask them like about the uh, something we're learning if I, I'm facing some problems and these stuff. But being here on campus and especially coach campus, like uh, I guess like uh, being in coach like is a thing that everyone could ask for. Like if you come here to campus, uh, see what we have actually, like I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that you will like it. So here, like um, for my second year, like I had the opportunity to, to go to labs to meet like uh, our teaching assistants is if I'm facing difficulties in the, in the courses. And I uh, wanna mention that Raul is my co-tutor for my cell biology course. So yeah, you'll, you'll always like find someone who can, who can help you. Um, also what I'm gonna say that uh, you can do like everything you want. You can imagine like Coach Campus like is a small city. You can go to to cafeterias. We have like always um, 
study areas here in campus. We have the sports center. We have ice skating, like everything is here. So it's a great experience to be in campus. Thank you, Jen. I hope you have used the ice rink uh, before they, they close it for the spring and summer. <laughs> Um, so, Camila, uh, what has been your experience so far at Cochino mm, uh, Thank you. Um, it's been great, right? Yeah, my first year here was of why my first semester and uh, from starting from the second half of the second semester till the end of the sophomore year, it was online. So yeah, I, I didn't have enough time to make friends here. So plus to the advice that students gave to the prospective students, I would I want to say that please don't um, prioritize making friends here, prioritize making your own community here, because the first year is the most important year to do that, because later it's going to be harder. Like everyone has their own group of friends and you're going to find yourself like uh, without friends, but uh, hopefully not. So yeah, and this year I started going to the laboratory as everything is offline. I joined the lab. I really hope that I'll be able to start the research by the end of my undergraduate degree and maybe more. So when you're on campus, the opportunities are really endless and everywhere you have new experience coming to you. Yeah. Thank you, Camila. But yeah, it, it was a tough period, as, as you mentioned, to build a community, to make friends, because we can never do, yeah, right. do that in a Zoom <laughs> um, environment. Finally, Raul. What yeah, I'm slightly yeah. envious towards uh, freshmen and sophomore students here because I've been at the university for the entire duration of the pandemic, and that's why I've spent uh, most um, most number of semesters online. So um, definitely missed out on some of the experience here, but you're not facing the same dangers, I think. So um, you're gonna get a, a full range of experience if you come here. And since I've come back here in September, it's been great. Uh, we've finally been able to go back to our student laboratories. Uh, and even uh, during the online period, um, I was invited uh, to a research laboratory uh, once we come back, so um, that's been great as well. Um, and I hope um, all the students um, can find such an opportunity if they want to. Um, yeah, I've been able to take um, all the courses that I want and um, that, that's what I really like. Um, I've never really struggled to find a course um, that I need um, for example, I, I'm going to apply for a master's program in biotechnology, uh, which is not exactly related, not exactly molecular biology it is related, but I can satisfy all the prerequisites by uh, taking appropriate electives in my senior year. So overall, theoretically and practically and extracurricularly, uh, it's been a great experience. Very happy to hear that, Raul, and, and I wish you all the success in all of your graduate uh, applications. And yeah, you know that I, there's a bright future ahead. So uh, there are a couple of questions that I will touch upon, and we have really run <laughs> way besides our initial plan time. So I want to thank again all of our students and Professor Salam for staying with us until now, and of course, of course, our participants as well. So what I will do now is, if it's okay, our student panelists, if you're free to, to leave the webinar, if you wish, if you have other commitments, uh, as well as Professor Salam, I want to thank you so much again. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you on campus uh, at some point. Um, yeah. When, yeah. Yeah, can I just answer a few of these? Yeah, yeah, of course, yes, if you want, of course. There's one who's saying that, could we take a course of molecular biology and genetics if we want to study medicine? Hmm. And a lot of people here, like a lot of students that are in, uh, that are studying medicine actually do either a double major or a, you know, um, double major with molecular biology and genetics, hmm. and like 90% of them take molecular biology and genetics classes. So again, yeah, you can totally do that if you want to. We had another question here who wants to do a double major in computer engineering. Yes, 
definitely you can do a double major with anything. We actually do have computer engineering, like a lot of students from computer engineering take my class in bioinformatics, for example. So again, uh, all of that is uh, possible. Um, yeah, you can also move to medical related fields for masters and what if you have a molecular biology and genetics degree, actually they prefer us. So again, if you if you want to be a medical researcher and not a medical doctor, so if you're mm -hmm. if you're career goal is not to be a medical practitioner, but to actually do medical science research, it will be very advantageous. Like they'll prefer a molecular biology genetic degree to actually a normal uh, medical degree or different things. So again, yeah, definitely that that's actually a better career path uh, to medical research than actually studying medicine itself. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. When I look at our own Coach University graduate program requirements in our graduate school of health sciences for our um, research masters in areas like reproductive medicine, microbiology, physiology. One of the preferred degrees is molecular biology and genetics or biology degrees. So definitely that's that's a possibility. The last question that we have left here is, um, I mean, what is our offer in terms of interdisciplinary works? What kind of support is given? And I think, um, I think interdisciplinary is across the whole university in terms of how our research centers and labs are set up. You never find professors, for example, from just one area. They're all coming from engineering, from chemistry, from uh, molecular biology and genetics, especially in the research centers. In terms of um, maybe Professor Salam, you can, you know, for example, in how you're designing courses or within your department, the way that professors uh, design the courses and revise the curriculum of those courses, uh, do you consider that there is, you know, interdisciplinary kind of knowledge so, included in the courses? Uh, so, like we right now in the molecular biology department, we have eight faculty, and three of those faculty, uh, like two of them, are joint faculty with the School of Medicine, and one of them is joint faculty with uh, the School of Chemical and Biological Engineering. So we're actually even interdisciplinary faculty. So there's. There's lots of inter, inter, interdisciplinary courses um, and labs that are offered. Like most of our labs are interdisciplinary themselves as well. So again, it's the environment is interdisciplinary here. So there's there's all sorts of opportunities. Again, that's that question is just like just the makeup of the molecular biology and genetics department shows that like interdisciplinary. Uh, way of doing things is a hallmark of Koch University, and so it's also a hallmark of the molecular biology and genetics uh, department. So yeah, you'll, you'll find no shortage of that here. Thank you, exactly. So thank you so much again to our students and Professor Salam for your time today. Um, so I'm going to switch back to a couple of slides here to talk about our admissions to the College of Science, not only for molecular biology and genetics, but also for the other programs in the college, such as mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Uh, yeah. When you look, sorry. For me, can I leave? Sorry, I cut yes, you off. Of course, of course, Madame, yes. Thank you so much. There's any like burning questions someone has I got? I think uh, from the Q&A, no. Let me just briefly check yeah, no, I'll leave the chat. One. Uh, no, so that's okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much, Professor, for your time. And thank you, of course, again to our students. Um, it's always great to to be, you know, to talk to you guys. So just email us. Like, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, there is a question here. How can we contact the professor or the students? I don't know about the students. Uh, what I would say is to our panel students, if you wish to share any contact details, you can do that on the chat. If not, it's up to you. For professors, um, when you go to the college websites, you see for each college, bye -bye, uh, you see for each of the colleges, there are the, there is a faculty page and on there you can see their individual profiles and you can see their email addresses, their um, websites where you can find out more about their research and the courses they're teaching. And you can also find in some cases their um, phone number, their extension number, but usually people communicate with them via email, especially prospective graduate students. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. So going back to admission um, and scholarship related questions, when you look at our admission system at Coach University for international undergraduate students, 
It's very similar to an American university, like selective admissions process. It's also holistic in the sense that there isn't a single element of the list that you see on the screen that determines whether someone um, is admitted and receives a scholarship or not. So every element of the application is considered by the college. So each applicant is evaluated by a committee of the College of Science. This is typically the dean, associate deans, and in some cases, uh, one or two professors from the relevant departments. And what they're going to look at, first of all, is uh, whether they're, that you are applying with uh, one of the eligible standardized university admission exams or diploma scores. The list that I'm showing here on screen is not exhaustive. There are other exams that we accept. Uh, however, the most common ones from admitted students would be the SAT or AP courses that you have taken or the ACT exam. Or if you're coming from the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, then your final grade predicted grades. Or if you're coming from a British curriculum and you have taken A levels, uh, so A2 levels, you can also apply with that. There are other exams. For example, there's European Baccalaureate. There is now um, for Kazakhstan, the ENT exam results as well. Um, there are the, for uh, students applying from Germany, there is the Abitur exam. For students from Switzerland, there is the Matura. Uh, so there is not a very long list of exams or diplomas. So we strongly recommend that if you are graduating uh, from high school with your national uh, curriculum, that you, in order to apply and have a better chance of admission, that you also apply with, for example, SAT or ACT exam. Okay. In terms of the College of Science, the minimum scores are, as you see here, for the SAT, for example, is 1,180 out of 1,600. Having the minimum score does not mean that you will be admitted. So usually our admitted students have scores higher than that. Uh, we will be publishing on our website in the next couple of months the data about the average SAT scores and IB and, A and especially SAT and IB scores of previously admitted students from the previous fall, for fall 2021, to also give you an idea of you know, where you should be aiming at in terms of your preparation for these tests. Um, there was a question about what were the A-level requirements for molecular biology and genetics. So uh, two relevant courses. This means that it could be in biology, in chemistry. Uh, maths is always a, a good thing to have in your, uh, your A-levels. Minimum B grades, but as I said, most admitted students usually would have out of those two relevant, two or more relevant courses, at least um, an A or an A plus A star grade. Sorry. So the other element that it's part of the admissions is the transcripts. So this is your high school transcript that show uh, from year 9, 10, 11, and if your country also has a 12th year of high school, then also that year. A motivation letter, this is something that uh, we have specific tutorials on our website about how to prepare your motivation letter. There's sample letters from previously admitted students for different colleges, including College of Science. A recommendation letter, this is, this is not a, something you upload yourself, but you put the contact details of someone who will provide a recommendation on your behalf. Typically, this would be someone in your school, such as your university or career counselor or one of your teachers, for example, in biology, in maths, in physics, it doesn't necessarily have to be them, but, you know, someone who think who you think will give, um, you know, a, a good recommendation of you about your academic abilities. Um, if there's any extracurricular activities that you have or awards or achievements, this is very important to also include because this is what can make a difference between, uh, for example, being considered for a scholarship or not. Uh, we do have admitted students that have very high scores, both in their years of high school, as well as in standard tests such as SAT, yet they're not awarded a scholarship when we get the question of why. Um, and simple answer is, you know, they're stronger candidates that have similar scores plus other you know elements that show you know well-rounded kind of um human beings so whether that's in sports in volunteering in student clubs in societies in whatever you know you're into but make sure that you provide details about that um for this year uh there uh, was an implementation of a video interview that you record on the application system it's not a knowledge-based 
interview. The questions are not about your knowledge of, for example, biology or uh, chemistry or mathematics. It's not about that. It's more about your motivation to study molecular biology. What do you think makes you a strong candidate? What challenges you have faced or your opinion on some topics, which, you know, it's not nothing in, in depth about biology, for example. There is an application fee of 250 Turkish lira, which is approximately $17,000 that is paid online through the application system. The deadline for this year is July 1st, and we open applications every year in January. We used to open them earlier in December, uh, but we have now changed the, the timeline and we will be opening, for example, for fall 2023, we will be opening the applications from uh, 1st of January. And we usually close in early July. Everything is done online. So we have a, an application system, which you can see on the screen. The address is apply.ku.edu.tr. And you submit, basically, you upload all of these documents, such as your transcripts, your test scores, any certificates that you have, you upload them there. And then you also type your motivation letter. And as I mentioned, you put the contact details for um, a referee. Now let's talk about scholarships because there were several questions about that. So our tuition, at Koch University for international undergraduate students who don't have Turkish citizenship is paid in dollars and it's $19,500 per year. That tuition has not changed. This is specifically uh, for all colleges except medicine. So for molecular biology, this is the tuition fee per year. This tuition has not changed in the past um, four years. Um, it, there's no guarantee it may or may not change for last year, uh, but as of, as of this upcoming academic year, this is the tuition. When we look at living costs in Istanbul, uh, there has been inflation as in other parts of the world, and at the moment we're calculating uh, that students should consider a budget of between seven to $9,000 per year, including dormitory accommodation. In, for example, this is based on someone staying in our student dormitories in a shared room. Of course, you can spend less than that per year, or more than that, according to your lifestyle. Um, in terms of scholarships, though, uh, especially for programs like molecular biology and genetics, where we don't receive, we receive a very high number of applications, but not as high for other programs such as medicine or computer engineering. So the, the scholarship chances, let's say, for programs like molecular biology are slightly higher. That doesn't mean everyone gets a scholarship, but they're less competitive than, than for programs like medicine. So there, is not, there isn't a separate process or form or deadline, simply you apply to the program, for example, molecular biology, and you can apply for more than one program. By, by the way, you can apply for up to three undergraduate majors when you're submitting your application and you're automatically evaluated by the same committee. So the, the College of Sciences, in this case, that evaluation committee would also consider you for a scholarship. These are only for tuition, so they do not cover other costs such as dormitories, books, um, transport, or other costs, um, but they are for the duration of study. So if you are awarded a partial or full scholarship, it will last for four years, and if you need to extend your studies for another year because you're doing a double major, for example, that scholarship also, you know, is extended for a year. Another situation, which I think there was a question about this, is um, if you do a double major and you receive the, a partial scholarship, for example, or a full scholarship, then yes, the, the other major that you're doing the, the, pro, you know, the other major, you also have the same scholarship because there's no, there's no extra tuition to pay. That's a, that's one of the biggest, I think, opportunities of um, studying in a university like Koch. Or if you transfer, for example, let's say that you uh, were accepted to molecular biology and genetics, and like the case that one of our student panelists, uh, Camila, was mentioning about her friend, who then changed her mind and said, well, actually, I want to study chemistry, or I want to study computer engineering. You apply for internal transfer, and if you're accepted, also the, the dean of the college that you're transferring to will decide if your scholarship can also be uh, transfer and maintain. Most of the time it is. There are some GPA requirements for that, that you should, you know, you have a, a certain GPA higher than a specific number, um, and there is a motivation letter if I'm not wrong. So the types of scholarships that we have are entirely based on academic merit, not on financial need. This can be full, which means that you don't pay any tuition for the four years of your studies, 
or they can be of 75%, 50%, or 25%. The most um, common type, I would say, of scholarships are 50%, but there isn't a, a straightforward answer as to if I have this SAT score, what type of scholarship I would receive, or if I have this IB score or this A levels, would I get a scholarship? Because as I said, the, the decision is made by the college admissions committee and they take into account the scores, your high school transcripts, your motivation letter, your references, your extracurriculars, and anything else that they can gather from your application. Okay, so I just wanted to also mention this briefly in case there's any of our participants today who are in year nine or year 10. Uh, so meaning that you're not, not going to graduate this summer, but that you will be graduating in summer of 2023, um, then we have a summer research program for high school students and also for undergraduate students, which is great because it's an opportunity to do a research internship with our professors, including molecular biology and genetics. And it's every summer between July and August. Um, there's no tuition because you're essentially working as a research assistant with one of the professors, you're given a task, you're part of a team, you achieve that task. If you do a good job, then you get a certificate and a letter of recommendation with the professor that you work with. It's a great opportunity that if, if you're not sure about molecular biology and genetics, then it's a chance to really see what, what a day-to-day -day life as, as a student in this field is like as a researcher. The website is shown on the screen. The applications for this summer have now closed. They closed on the 22nd of April, for, but for next year, they will open in February and they will close, close again in April. Um, here are our contact details. Our main form of communication is via email, which I know is not very popular <laughs> with some of you, but we prefer that channel because we are able to track and try to answer within 48 hours, except if it's on a weekend or uh, national holiday like the one we have in Turkey coming up next week. Our website is international.ku.edu.tr. You will find all of this information in there. So as I mentioned, we have these really great videos on our YouTube channel, which is called Coach University International Admissions. There is a specific playlist called Explore Your Future. So again, if you're thinking, researching what major would be the best for me, there is a video for each of the 22 undergraduate programs at Coach University, which are um, narrated, let's say, by our professors. So I would really encourage you to listen to the molecular biology and genetics one with Professor Hassan Demirji. Uh, it's really exciting to just listen to him and the work that he's doing and, and what this field is like. And of course, um, I invite you to follow us on social media, especially on Instagram, where we are always putting information about our admissions, our students, our alumni. So um, then let me just check if I have covered all questions. So international GCSEs and international A-levels accepted. Um, if you're referring to, for example, Cambridge or Pearson A-levels, yes. Uh, when or how do one apply for a scholarship? So um, there isn't a separate when or how. You, you apply for admission to the program, molecular biology or any other program. And if you are offered admission, your admission letter will also tell you if you have been awarded a scholarship, whether a full one, a partial one, or no scholarship. Let me see on the Q&A. Um, there's some questions from admitted students. So I'm really happy to see you guys here. Um, we look forward to meeting you in person. So if you have re received your acceptance letter, but you haven't received your ID yet, yes, you will receive it soon. It's usually about a week, week and a half after you get your acceptance letter, then our registrar's office, they, they generate the ID and then it's sent uh, through the system to you. So please hold, you know, if you received it uh, recently, then you should get it within a week, week and a half. Uh, can a Turkish student apply this way? Okay, this is a tricky question because there are specific rules which are not set by the university, but by the Higher Education Council of Turkey, which is a regulatory body for universities in Turkey. So um, it depends on uh, if you have double citizenship and your first citizenship is Turkish, it means that yes, you can apply, but you need to renounce your Turkish citizenship. Or if you are Turkish, but you studied your whole high school education outside of Turkey, then 
you are eligible to apply. There are some specific rules there. So what I would um, ask you is to please check our website and, and it will guide you to our registrar's page, which is where there are the specific rules. And you see, if you see that you qualify as an international student with Turkish citizenship, then you can apply. Um, is AP obligator mandatory? No, it's just if you have taken AP courses, please include them in your application. Again, if you have a score above the minimum, uh, we always advise to students, it's not, it's not a good idea to include as many test scores if you, that you have, if some of them you, you are not particular, if you didn't perform very well in some of them. So try to pick the test scores or grades that showcase you in the best possible way. Is Duolingo English test accepted for English proficiency? It is not uh, because, again, the Higher Council Education of Turkey doesn't consider it um, an eligible test. If you have taken it and have a score, you can include it. But for us, English proficiency tests are an optional part of the application because if you're accepted, you can also take our own internal Koch University um, English placement exam and then the proficiency exam in September. That's for all new students, Turkish or international. Um, so that's why it's not a mandatory part of the application. Um, okay, so there's a question here for someone who applied for Turkish scholarships and you listed coach as your first choice, great. Uh, you have received a offer letter. Um, are you still eligible for Turkey Bursa? So the process is if you um, we will receive a list from Turkey Bursleta uh, around end of July or early August with the candidates that they have also selected after their round of interviews. If your name is in that list um, and if it's approved by our vice president for academic affairs, then you would still be admitted, of course, but then your scholarship type would be changed to Turkish scholarships and it would be 100% scholarship that also includes other benefits which are from Turkish scholarships. Um, okay, so Jansu, you're asking about your ID number. Okay, can I kindly ask you to please send us an email? I'm taking a note of your name as well here so that we can check with our registrar's office. Thank you for letting us know, but if you can please send us an email as well, just uh, to double check because yes, you should have received it by now, but it's not, it's not nothing to worry about. Um, can I get a scholarship without a letter of recommendation because I can't get it? And uh, that's tricky because it, a, a recommendation letter is a required part of our application. Now you can maybe think a bit wider in terms of who you can ask to be your referee. It doesn't have to be a teacher at your school. It could also be people, for example, if you play sports, it could be one of your coaches. If you have volunteer, it could be people who have supervised you in your volunteering activities. If you have uh, worked, you know, part-time uh, during your high school um, studies, you can, it can be also, again, a person who has supervised you. It can be the principal in your school. It doesn't need to be necessarily one of your, your teachers. Uh, okay, I'm going to just scan very briefly about other admission related questions. But thank you very much for all of you to stay a bit longer than than planned. Um, just checking here. Uh, there was a question about are we able to pick electives in our first year? And uh, thank you for us or one of our student panelists for answering. Yes, you pick electives in your third or fourth year. The first year especially is quite structured in the sense that you need to take some of the core courses and then some of your molecular biology and, and genetics um, courses. Uh, is there an age limit for obtaining a scholarship for a bachelor's degree at this university? No, there isn't an age limit in terms of admission to any program, whether that's undergraduate, master's or PhD, as well as for a scholarship. There, if you are applying for Turkish scholarships, which is a national Turkish government scholarship program for international students, they do have um, some age restrictions for each level. So I think for undergraduate programs, uh, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not wrong, is 21. But that's if you're also applying to Turkish scholarships. Okay, so let me just check very quickly. 
And how does the application and chance to get a scholarship of those with Turkish citizenship differ from those with an international uh, scholarship? Um, there are the Turkish students who enter through the national university exam of Turkey. Um, and that is based on your ranking in that exam and on our, not on our website, but on the Adailar. I will type this up on the chat in case you are still here. So this is a website in Turkish. Um, Okay, I typed it now. In our adailar.ku.tr website, you can see what were the results of the previous year's placed students in molecular biology and genetics. And uh, for each scholarship type, like full scholarship or 50% scholarship or no scholarship, what were their rankings? If you're a Turkish student who is eligible to apply as an international student, uh, there isn't a different, there isn't an advantage or a disadvantage because again, it's it's merit based, not based on nationality. Uh, what is the required GPA? There isn't a minimum GPA for the high school studies. I mean, for your transcripts, uh, there are minimum scores for the standard tests like SAT or ACT. And there was a question about exchange programs. So the answer is yes, you can you can do an, a semester exchange in a university that coach does not have a partnership with, but it it's you kind of have to initiate the partnership process. So our Office of International Program is the unit responsible for that. And you can go to them and say, I would like to do a semester exchange at X university. Um, then they start to check, for example, with our with the dean, let's say of the College of Science, if there is any interest in establishing a student and faculty, for example, um, exchange with that university, they contact the other university, they inquire, and then they let you know. If it's not possible, if the other university says, no, we would not like to establish an exchange partnership, then usually you're able to join as a special student, but you just need to make sure that the credits that you will take at that university will be then um, transferred and valid in your in your coach university transcripts. That's something that it's all explained during the orientation period and um, by our Office of International Programs. They do a lot of information sessions at the start so that you plan ahead for your semester for your exchange plans. And let's see. Mm -hmm. Does, uh, do we accept credits from international students coming from the United States? I'm gonna interpret this question as someone who has already started university in the United States and you're asking about transferring to our program. Uh, the answer is yes. If you apply as a transfer student from a university abroad, you apply. And if you're offered admission, then they will let you know which courses and credits and how many credits uh, will be transferred from your previous or current university education into our program. Uh, so what is the minimum SAT? We have talked about this. Does the tuition fee change a lot from year to year? As I mentioned, uh, not really. So our tuition for international, I do apologize. There's a automatic alarm. Here. <laughs> okay, I think we have covered, let's see if there's any other questions? Okay. So there is a last question about the Turkish ID number on our application form, I guess. Um, that's, that's if you're already living in Turkey and you have a residence permit, uh, that's what Turkish ID number ref refers to. Uh, if you want more, guidance on that, you, you can check actually our International Community Office website. I'm going to type the address on the chat here. It's ico.ku.edu.tr. They have a section about student residence permit, and that's, that's the number that we refer to as Turkish ID for international students. Okay, so uh, we have really overrun our initial plan time, so I want to thank everyone for staying until you have. Um, and if you have any questions, please get in touch. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a great 
uh, rest of the week and that wherever you're joining us from that you have a, a good evening or morning okay thank you very much you will receive the recording of the webinar uh in a uh, by end of tomorrow bye bye